Bueno, muy buena tarde. ¿Están? Sí. Buena tarde a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por venir. Eh, desde el IEMET, eh, en particular el programa de, de igualdad de género, están muy contentas de acudir a esta, a esta nueva edición de Xabaca. Eh, las protagonistas eh, de, esta, de esta segunda edición. Eh, Xabaca es una xarxa internacional contra la censura a las artistas árabes. Y aquí esta acta se enmarca en la Bienal del Pensamiento de, de Barcelona. Um, y ahora um, os haré una muy breve, breve introducción. Um, porque, um, estamos muy contentas porque nos parece muy importante contar con la mirada de las artistas eh, y las creadoras que luchan contra el patriarcado y, y contra los roles que sovint nos, nos asigna la sociedad y que luchan por la libertad de expresión. Y bueno, antes de, de pasar la palabra a las nuestras convidadas, voy a hacer unos cinco centimos eh, so, eh, de una exposición que he montado eh, a molde cariño a, a la Fundación de Donas Euromediterráneas. Y es una exposición que también va vinculada a el tema que nos ocupa hoy, y por eso voy a mencionarla. Eh, es una exposición que es de Donas Trencan Barreras, Transforman las Ciudades Mediterráneas. Y, eh, es de la Fundación de Donas Euromediterráneas, como de Avance, que de la cual Liemet es un de los seis miembros fundadores. Y esta fundación eh, actúa para el apoderamiento de las donas a la ribera sur y este del Mediterráneo y a los países eh, de la Unión Europea. ¿Vale? Y ahora la exposición que os decía la pude ver a la Ateneo La Armonía a San Andreu, Uh, fins al día 14 y después se irá a Torre de Embarra y después se a Barcelona a Torre Jussana. Y es una exposición que es el resultado de un concurso que me ha hace un año, uh, gairebé, el 25 de noviembre, día de la eliminación de las violencias contra las donas, día internacional. Y es una exposición... Eh, a ver si funciona eso. Sí, pude, pude ver aquí uh, tres, uh, las tres fotos ganadoras de la exposición que es el resultado de un, de, del concurso. Y una mica, justamente, uh, aquí estas fotos que son fetas por donas amateurs o fotógrafas profesionales mostran donas que reivindican el seu espai a la sociedad. Y uh, pueden ser uh, donas uh, que uh, volen ser uh, periodistas esportivas a, a la Franja de Gaza, donde això está muy mal visto. Una otra, una otra historia y una otra foto explica la historia de una dona turca que se ha presentado a las elecciones parlamentarias de Turquía después de haber estado obligada a prostituirse durante años. O sea, sigui que es algo que realmente ha tirado de endavant y, y ha cambiado el seu destino. Y también hay una 
um, que um, é uh, a atriz libanesa Hanan uh, Haj Ali, que é uma, é uma atriz que ajuda para poder fazer teatro, porque os seus pares não aceitavam que ela fez teatro. E... I llavors, bueno, crec que és interessant mencionar-vos la exposició en relació amb, amb l'acte d'avui. Um, I també perquè, tot i que podem pensar que el feminisme ha conegut un boom, que ara amb Me Too i el moviment global i també, bueno, l'últim 8 de març a Espanya i a Catalunya, que ha estat uh, també un moviment molt important, podem pensar que, que ja està tot fet, però no. Al contrari, nosaltres pensem que les iniciatives com Xabaca han de tenir més suport i més recolzament. Um, I per això em sembla tan important que avui la, la ALA i la SONDOS ens, ens expliquin la seva visió uh, de la seva societat, eh, dels models tradicionals, de la religió, bueno, ara ens explicaran. Però eh, això no és fàcil. El que elles fan, eh, parlar amb llibertat eh, als seus països no és fàcil. I volia aprofitar l'espai per recordar que des de fa tres mes mesos, a l'Iraq, eh, hi han hagut cinc dones assassinades, eh, uns feminicidis, eh, eren cinc dones que tenien poder d'influència o que podien haver-ne tingut. Una era una blogger, una era activista pels drets de les dones, du dues dones gestionava, gestionen un saló de bellesa i una altra era cirurgiana plàstica. Doncs, totes aquestes dones han estat assassinades fa, fa, fa tres mesos i per això dic que encara eh, em sembla que pues, eh, tenim molt de recorregut per fer i per eh, poder eh, lluitar contra les violències i poder expressar-se i, viu i viure la vida que, que volem. I acabaré amb aquesta cita eh, de l'antropòloga la Rita Segato, que, que deia que els crims contra les dones eh, són polítics perquè el, patriar el patriarcat no és una cultura, és un ordre polític. Crec que potser és una reflexió que, que, que podem també guardar en ment. I ara anirà a buscar uns cascos, perquè veig que no tenen la traducció, eh, però bueno, Mireia, si vols eh, començar a explicar. Eh, moltes gràcies. I si teniu qualsevol dubte, tenim aquí també molta documentació i informació i trobeu tot a la, a la nostra web, que està aquí, i si voleu també saber més sobre l'exposició, estem a la vostra disposició. Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies, uh, gràcies per haver vingut. Uh, jo us parlo com, una de, com a portaveu d'una de les organitzacions implicades en Xava, que som tres organitzacions, uh, Novact, Fundació Alfanar i Giuar. Aquest projecte uh, es va formar, es va gestar l'any passat amb una subvenció de l'Agència Catalana de Cooperació al Desenvolupament que ens va permetre refer una primera edició eh, molt, podríem dir, més, eh, més gran i més ambiciosa de, del projecte. En guany només podem tenir dues artistes. L'any passat també hem tenir cinc. Com bé ha dit eh, l'Emili, Xava, que vol dir xarxa en àrab. Xava, que és una xarxa internacional, pretén ser, arribar a ser, perquè ara són tot, és tot just al començament, una xarxa internacional contra la censura i l'autocensura en les pràctiques artístiques de les artistes àrabs, quan diem àrabs volem dir de països amb cultura àrab dominant. Sabem que dir àrab és, dir, és que moltes vegades quedar-nos curts i jo personalment no em sento confortable només amb aquest, amb aquest adjectiu. Però bé, ho hem simplificat així, Un, una de les parts implicades és la Fundació Alfanar que treballa pel coneixement de la cultura i, i de la regió de cultura dominant àrab. Aleshores, doncs bé, és així com ex, expliquem una mica aquest treball amb artistes que bàsicament són de la regió doncs, de bueno, Nord-Àfrica, Orient Mitjà, Sudan, eh, també està inclòs i estem molt contents perquè enguany tenim una artista sudanesa que almenys en el nostre cas que estem acostumats a treballar amb artistes, podríem dir, de, de la riba sud del Mediterrani, de països africans, amb, no havíem tingut mai l'oportunitat de treballar amb una artista sudanesa, per tant, bueno, això també ens fa, ens fa molt feliços. Aleshores, Xàbaca no només compta amb el paper de les artistes i amb la presència importantíssima de les artistes, en aquest cas, en una residència a Barcelona, pensem que és molt important trobar un espai, podríem dir, neutre, de creació en llibertat, un espai on aquestes artistes es troben fora dels seus contextos habituals i es poden trobar amb artistes que 
que normalment no hauríem pogut trobar, per senzillament, l'any passat, teníem amb nosaltres una cantautora palestina i una artista visual libanesa. Aquestes dues persones, una amb passaport israelià, l'altra amb passaport libanès, no s'haguessin pogut trobar mai ni al Líban ni a ni a Palestina. Aleshores, és donar aquesta oportunitat. És molt complicada la connexió sur-nord, tenim un problema de visats, nosaltres mateixos, i ara aquí vull dir-ho públicament, perquè és una realitat constant, que l'IEMET segur que també coneix molt. Tenim la denegació, la recent denegació de tres visats de tres artistes iranians que havien de venir en residència l'any que ve, i avui mateix un artista egipci m'ha dit que també li han denegat el seu visat per venir també el mes que ve, o sigui, l'any que ve ens hem quedat penjats per denegacions de visats quan un d'aquests artistes iranians havia vingut l'any passat en residència i havia fet un treball a l'espai públic molt interessant. Bé, són aquestes arbitrarietats. És molt difícil aquests moviments sud-nord, perquè nord-sur sabem que no, sud-nord són molt complicats, però també ho són sur-sur moltes vegades. Coneixem una fundació que es diu Roberto Ximeta que treballa precisament per promoure aquests moviments intraregionals que són molt més complicats també per temes de visats del que podríem pensar. Aleshores, pensem que aquest espai aquí a Barcelona, en aquest cas a Giuar, a la nostra residència, que és un espai de treball i de vida en el que elles conviuen i treballen, doncs penso que, bueno, pensem que és molt important per poder fer això, un treball en llibertat fora dels contextos habituals i tots sabem que quan prenem un recul del nostre dia a dia veiem les coses diferents i poden sorgir coses noves. Només comentar, l'any passat vam tenir, com us he dit, cinc artistes, era Haya Zatri, una cantautora palestina, dues cineastes del Marroc, Huda Lahdar i Sofia Issawi, vam tenir l'artista visual libanesa Fàtima Mortada i finalment la il·lustradora tunisenca, tunisiana, Farah Ben Mansur. Xava, que parlem de xarxa, no només per aquesta xarxa finalment de relacions personals i professionals entre aquestes artistes de diferents països, sinó perquè també s'implica en el projecte entitats que treballen sobre el terreny en els països dels quals provenen aquestes artistes. Aleshores, això vol dir que tenim un referent, una associació local referent en cada un d'aquests països. A Palestina és Darel Candil, a Líban és Espàs Vancet, que és un espai feminista que hi ha a Beirut, que fan coses realment increïbles, totes dissimulant i totes fent veure que no fan res, que només queden per prendre el te i allò és la revolució el que estan fent, però ningú ho sap. Llavors a Tunísia hi ha una associació que es diu Fanny Rahman Ani i al Marroc és Lluzin, que és un espai de creació, sobretot per joves, espai de residència i de creació. Aleshores, en dues edicions de Xàbaca hem rebut 200... Entre la 1 i la 2, és que ara no recordo, crec que l'any passat van ser... 140 i pico i en guany han estat 90 i pico, o sigui, són 230 candidatures de dones, artistes d'aquesta regió, diguem-ne, per simplificar, àrab. Bueno, són moltes dones, molts perfils, molt interessants, alguns amb unes històries realment impressionants. Només n'hem pogut triar dos en guany. En guany és l'Ajuntament de Barcelona qui ens ha subvencionat un xava que més modest, però un xava del qual també estem molt orgullosos i almenys són dues persones que hem pogut, dues dones que hem pogut beneficiar. I això, només dir això, que 230 candidatures, fins ara s'han beneficiat set artistes i el una mica el llegat o el missatge de xava que és crear aquesta xarxa nodridora, podríem dir, en el que els valors principals és la idea de l'artista com a generadora de canvi social i de persona transmissora de certs valors en els seus contextos de creació específics, que com veurem no és el mateix el context de creació al Caire com el context de creació a Cartum. Aleshores, només presentar breument les dues artistes, són dos Xavallec, és storyteller, directora teatral, ex-periodista i escriptora i directora artística i cofundadora del projecte Bussi, que com veureu és un projecte que va començar l'any 2006 
molt abans del Me Too, al Caire hi havia unes dones que estaven fent coses extraordinàries i que segueixen fent i que segueixen lluitant per fer-les, ella mateixa s'ho explicarà. Lala Satir és arquitecta de formació, il·lustradora, artista visual de Cartum, de Sudan, i entén la pràctica artística com una rebel·lió contra els valors dominants socials i polítics entre els quals s'ha criat. Aleshores, ara passem la paraula a l'Ala Satir per començar i continuarem a poc a poc. Gràcies. Hi. Uh, hi, how are you? Thank you for the introduction. My name is Ala Satir. Uh, as she said, I am an architect, or I was an architect. I went to architecture school. And then after I graduated, I decided to pivot into uh, visual arts. And there is a lot of reasons why I decided to go to visual arts, because mainly I wanted to have a new way to express myself creatively. And also I felt like there is a lot of power that comes with visual art and a lot of freedom that comes with visual art. And um, also it, it very soon it became my voice and my way to uh, say my opinions about the world or say uh, tackle certain topics and uh, the power that art has to, to, um, to be able to talk about things that are very hard to talk about in everyday life. It gives it this maybe shelter it to make it more acceptable for people to accept certain things. It creates the safe environment for people to be able to talk about uh, certain topics that are very hard to talk about normally. And um, even, even I feel like the, the, the attitude of people maybe changes in the presence of art. They become more tolerant and they become more accepting to one, towards one another. And in a, in a, coming from um, a region that, um, that I come from, or from the society that I come from, it's, uh, we need that kind of indirect way to talk about these topics, whether they are political or social or whatever it is. And, um, and the thing is, because art, what it does, it's basically gives, it provokes emotion. So whether, whether you're, we're talking about music or visual art or, or movies or theater or whatever it is, it, at the end of your art experience, you feel something, a specific emotion. So if you're angry or you're feeling sad or you're feeling happy or whatever feelings you're having, that connects you to the problem more and that somehow starts um, ch making some sort of change within yourself and then that helps tra trans transform to maybe um, a bigger, bigger change within your society. Um, so, and uh, other than that, I think that um, uh, coming from, also coming from Sudan or uh, an African country, a Muslim country, uh, we suffer from that one story that's repeatedly told about us, which is very short and doesn't include us all. And it's very negative. And when you think about Sudan, you always think about poverty or you think about um, uh, oppression or you think about famine or all of that, these things that I'm not saying they're not happening, they are happening, but it's a very short story to tell about a very diverse and a big nation. So um, here comes the, our purpose as artists and to retell that story. So even if we want to say something negative, we want to say it ourselves. We don't want other people to, to tell to tell us uh, how we are living or, or to tell the story on our behalf. Um, and, that's, and that's purpose, I think, that really unites all Sudanese artists. And we're not trying to overlook the negative things. We are talking about them in our work, in our art. Um, being a cartoonist, of course, most of the cartoons are, are actually negative. We're talking about the negative things in our society, uh, but also um, trying to do that with, with um, uh, putting our culture in regard and trying to um, maybe uh, highlight the things in our culture that we like, that we want other people to see. And basically just writing a story, just telling a story because, because art is a way to document 
things and it's a way to write history as we go and and when when people go back to to learn about us they were going to see our music and go and see our art and and we have to be and we have this role to to leave something to leave something to to show how we used to think and how we are living our lives nowadays and the lack of present our presence in the media is 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 what's um, making this story about Sudan very short and very narrow. And um, it's actually starting to a bit change in the last few years that people are seeing the importance of art. And we can see that there is a lot of musicians and a lot of uh, visual artists and a lot of architects. And, and, this imp and the importance of art is uh, starting to be bigger and bigger. And people are starting to be more involved. And... Um, Maybe the practice, uh, maybe I want to talk a bit about the practice of art in Sudan. Maybe you might be curious of how to be an artist in a, in a country that um, is surrounded with a lot of boundaries and a lot of censorship. And thus, yes, we have a lot of boundaries and they differ. They are political, they are social, they are religious. It's a community that's in, in its core, it's... it's um, religion and, and, and family values and social values, and it's in the core of, of uh, the Sudanese community, and that's not always a bad thing, but um, what art does is sometimes pushes these boundaries or, or asks, or we, we, we present a question, or we try to, um, um, we try to um, tr question s certain things. And we do that in a way that it's not very, uh, comes across as vulgar or it comes across that something that will insult other people. So, because when we talk, you talk about a nation that holds those values, values very dear to their heart, you don't want to say anything that will provoke them so much that will not make them, make them part of the conversation or it will come across as an attack. So, I think that, that in a way that makes you a bit more creative because you wanna you wanna create something that is um, that touches the top subject that gives the um, talks about about uh, something and and it's um, and uh, gets the point across and uh, creates the conversation and it's powerful enough but at the same time putting a regard that you're talking to people that you don't want to offend and and are, and they are easily offended because they are surrounded with a lot of boundaries. Um, uh, other than that, if I want to talk about my work, is basically I started doing cartoons. And um, the cartoons that I do, I try my best to be very simple visuals that anybody can understand. Even if I have to, to use text, I, I try to use English because um, I want them to be universal. I want other people to be able to understand them. And uh, I'm not particularly a, a political cartoonist. I don't think I am. I am more like a social cartoonist, but um, maybe you live in a place where you don't have the luxury not to, not to care about politics because politics is part of your everyday life. It's part of, uh, it, it's really part of your politics and social life becomes one thing at some point. So um, a lot of time, of course, I tackle so political issues as well. And, uh, um, I talk about how is it, uh, most of my work is actually directed to about women and for women and trying to uh, document my experience of being a woman in this uh, day and age and in this country and in this region. And um, maybe I'll show you some of it. So I'll show you some of the cartoons and maybe give you a small backstory to each one. Um, this one is, of, of course, strictly political. It's, um, it says time to go, which is, um, I'm trying to say the, the power to the people, that people have the, the power to overthrow any regime, um, no matter how oppressive it is and no matter how, how, how difficult it is. It only takes time and it will only takes realization that, that you want to you wanna move forward and you want to stop whatever is happening. So, and that happened in a time where I think it was last year, um, December or November of last year, where Sudanese people were going through three days of civil disobedience. And 
I, I, ho I was hoping to say that something happened after that civil disobedience, but um, nothing, not any political change happened, but with the, the beautiful thing that happened on those three days that people start talking about politics more, uh, which is something that we don't talk about, not because of, of uh, particularly censorship or that we can talk about it, but because um, we are talking about a regime that has been ruling Sudan for the past uh, literally 30 years. So we reached a point of maybe people are feeling hopeless so we don't see the point of talking about overthrowing a government. And in three, those three days, the dynamic changed. People were talking about other possibilities and what could happen if, if we th overthrew the, this government and if we can or where can we start and if we should start from, from, from maybe our homes or ourselves first and then think about overthrowing the government itself. So whatever the conversation was, whether, well, whether you agreed with some of it or you disagreed with some of it, the, the fact that people were talking about it felt like there was hope and, and, um, and it felt like um, seriously people hold the power to, to, to determine their political future and, their, and how they wanna live. So yeah, that was one. Uh, this one is, is, is basically talking about social media. Uh, social media as means of therapy and uh, a lot, social media is actually, I don't, um, a lot of my cartoons actually uh, talks about the negative part of social media, but I feel like I shouldn't be doing that so much because I owe so much to social media being a social media based artist. But um, of course it has a negative part where people use it, which is not, in, in this case is actually not very, not very bad. People use it as a means of therapy, vending, vending on social media and, and talking about your problems all the time. So people yeah, use it as a means of, of therapy instead of um, using actual therapy. Um, this, this was part of an exhibition that was um, last March, which uh, talked about uh, women and uh, women rights and um, um, women-based violence, which uh, before, I, before I made this exhibition, it was a joint exhibition with another, with another female Sudanese artist, her name is Rayan. And before doing that exhibition, I had to talk with all the NGOs that were doing work on, on um, gender-based violence and doing work to stop things like uh, FGM. And, uh, and it was nice to see that there was a lot of work has been done. And those NGOs, I'm not talking about NGOs that started within like the past two or three years that were going on for years and working uh, a lot to, to be able to, to help people, not only in Khartoum, but, but and other cities where, where, where they need um, more of like awareness than, than, than and, uh, awareness to know more about their bodies and what they should allow and what they shouldn't allow. And this one is um, girls should uh, speak up more. It's, uh, it's something basically touches on the thing that um, when growing up as a girl, or maybe this is not something, that, not even a Sudanese, I don't think that's a Sudanese thing or an Arabic thing. I think this is uh, women in general will be able to relate is you grow up and all you hear is the things that you should do to be better, but they are only um, concerned with how you look and you should smile more, you should, you should wear your hair that way or dress that way or, and, not a lot of attention is given to how you should you should speak up when when something bad happens to you, for example, or how you should you should have opinions. But instead, being opinionated or being someone who has has a voice is actually considered something that's um, you should try to avoid because it's not maybe it's not attractive enough or something. For that's that's um, touches on that topic because girls should smile more or you should smile more is something that we all heard at some point. Um, that talks about um, sexual assault, which is maybe one of the only um, crimes out there that um, blames, blames the victim other than blames the oppressor. So it's always, uh, well, she got assaulted, so what, what was she wearing? What, what, if, she, if she was talking loud, if she was taking a walk um, late at night, it's always, trying to see what, what the victim did to des almost deserve that, that assault that happened to her. 
and maybe putting it that way will will make people see how how ridiculous it is that that we blame that you can actually blame women for for things like um, uh, what they wear or how they talk or uh, the time they decide to take walks at night or something for something as big as a sexual assault. Uh, this one talks about FGM. FGM is uh, female genital mutilation, which is something unfortunately still practiced in Sudan. Um, the, the numbers are dropping down, uh, but uh, still it's happening, which is uh, basically um, uh, denying a woman of having a, a full sexual experience and thinking of it as a taboo or, or something that she shouldn't have um, and, and sexual pleasure just being um, associated more with, 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 with something that a man should have but a woman is, is basically just a tool or um, uh, but, she, but, but the idea that, that female sexuality in, in general is something that people are not okay with yet and uh, they go to extreme measures like this to, to even eliminate it or make it, um, make it disappear or go away. And basically here I'm saying that a woman's body is hers and it shouldn't be edited, it shouldn't be touched and shouldn't be violated in that way. And uh, this illustration is um, basically it just talks about uh, how one, uh, the one woman effect, if you teach one woman, one generation, that, can t that will, will guarantee that more women uh, or another new generation will be educated and will know their, their rights and what to stand for and what to stand against. So it basically just features one woman, um, different women in different generations. And I think this is the last one. It's um, the, uh, okay, I have to explain this one because I don't think people will be here uh, familiar with Fair, Fair and Lovely. <laughs> Fair and Lovely is, is a bleaching cream that it's uh, very popular in the Middle East. I think it's Indian. Um, the product is Indian, but it's very, very, very um, um, popular in the Middle, uh, Middle East. And, and I don't like the, the ads actually of Fair and Lovely because it always associates succeeding in life with become becoming lighter and uh, and she uh, the women always featured getting what she wants at the end because she's she's light-skinned and um, and we unfortunately have this problem in, in Sudan and maybe in in so many c countries where 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 of um, where people are, are dark-skinned is um, the the more you will look like a white person or the more you look European or the more you're lighter the the more people will view you as attractive so basically, I took, I took the logo of Fair and Lovely and I changed it to Dark and Lovelier. It's the same logo, but with different typography. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I think I featured most of them, but maybe we can see this one. Okay. Uh, so this one is, talks about the fact that um, a woman's worth is usually, also this is not a, something that only women in my region goes through, is something that almost every woman goes through, is your value is always um, associated with the way you look. So if you're, if you're considered beautiful, then you're, you're more valuable. And, and that's, that's the thing, that's um, how, how, how we see women and how we, we, we really narrow the definition of what it makes you um, an amazing woman, that it's all about the way you look and it's all about, uh, and even the way you look is actually not very diverse, that you have to look a certain way for the society that you're in to see you as, as beautiful. And um, with, no, with little regard, regard, regard to who you are and your personality and, and what you stand for and, and maybe this illustration of her holding the, the sign of, um, of um, uh, the women gender as a mirror um, maybe says what I, what I, it makes a visual of what I just said. So, and I think, yeah, I, I, uh, I think, yeah, I went through most of them. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.
Voldria aprofitar que ha sortit aquesta crema índia que es diu Fair and Lovely, que ell ha dit Dark and Lovelier, per convidar-vos per veure no només un treball totalment relacionat amb aquest tema que l'Ala i la Sonda es van poder veure en la inauguració d'una exposició, que us deixo aquí els flyers, que tenim al Centre Cívic Fort Pienc, molt a prop d'aquí, en el qual hem acollit els artistes que han passat per Giuar del Sur Global. Li hem donat, li hem dit, artistes del Sur Global, entre els quals hi ha aquest artista que ha acabat de marxar, podríem dir, ha estat el mes de setembre, que es diu Nyendo Muki, és un artista de Kènia, que treballa des de l'animació i té un vídeo, un treball molt interessant que es diu Yellow Fever, que ha estat premiat arreu en molts certàmens, on parla d'aquest desig de moltes dones africanes de voler ser més blanques. Es qüestiona tot aquest imaginari des d'una perspectiva, ara quedaria molt bé dir, de colonial, però certament és aquesta perspectiva, i us convido, realment és un treball molt interessant, a l'igual que algunes peces molt poquetes, però tenim algunes peces també de les dues artistes visuals de Xàbaca de l'any passat, que són la Fara Ben Mansur i la Fàtima Mortada. Penso que val la pena fer aquesta recomanació perquè és just aquí i està molt lligat una mica amb les coses que estan sortint avui també. Només aquest petit comentari per donar pas a la Sondos. Hi, my name is Sondos and I work as the artistic director of the Busti Project in Cairo. The Busti Project is a performing arts project that basically works on documenting and performing gender-based stories from Cairo and other cities in Egypt on stage. Um, so we basically have women um, coming, joining workshops and then going on stage and sharing their own stories and it could be about anything related to their womanhood. Uh, and we also have men, but most of the time we're working with women. And the stories um, are very diverse. Uh, it's about anything that you experience as a woman or as a man. So it means your experience in the hairdresser or your experience walking down the street or your experience at work, at home, with your husband, with your kids. Um, so this means we uh, cover a wide range of topics. The project started in 2006. Um, I joined a year later. And since then we've been I mean, documenting and staging a lot of stories, uh, mostly about harassment in different places. And every single time we would publish a story online or perform it on stage, we would at least have one member of the audience or one reader say, this is improper. Why do you have to say the word ass or boobs? Why do you have to say, he groped me, he finger fucked me, why can't you just be polite about it? Why can't you just say the word harassment? So it was indecent and improper to kind of tell the people what really happened. But people weren't discussing the fact that it was improper for me to witness that happening. Um, and then years later when the Me Too campaign started, it felt slightly irrelevant to the moment we were in because it's been years since we've started talking about harassment stories. And it was like, suddenly people were saying, oh, there's harassment and there's been harassment since the 90s or even before that. Um, and I personally felt like I needed a kind of a different campaign. I needed the campaign that kind of supports me to tell the stories that really happened without just giving a label, a label that people now are accustomed to. It doesn't make any difference when I tell someone I was harassed or she was harassed because we grew very, the, the word has become uh, very familiar. Like we listen to it and we don't think what it really means and what the woman really goes through and how she feels. But sharing the actual details of the story do that. And so now we're, what we're concerned with and what we're working on in Busi in, in Egypt is exploring the culture and the heritage that led us to a point where it's become difficult for a woman to speak up. 
the, the kind of stories that leave a woman unable to really tell what happened. The reaction of her family, for example, the reaction of people on the streets, uh, the victim blaming that Ale was just talking about, um, exploring the idea of why we live in an environment that does not support us, that does not allow us to have agency over our bodies, even in 2018. Um, yeah, so that's about it. And I leave you with a very short video about the project that kinds of it, it tries to give an idea about the kind of work we do on theater. مشروع بيحاول يستخدم الحكي كوسيلة للتعبير عن النفس والتمكين دايماً بنقول الحكي بيقوينا بدينا احنا نعمل لنفسنا كرامة معاهم من غير قانون احنا قادرين نقف لنفسنا اه لا ما فيش حاجة اسمها انت حلو لما تتجوزي قولي انت حلو بس اللي انا مخدوم الكتب نشوف هلا حاجة بالتوريد بنحاول من خلال ورش الحكي اننا نخلق مساحة حرة للستات والرجالة إن هما يحكوا تجاربهم المختلفة سواء في الشارع أو البيت أو الشغل تجارب ممكن يكون مجتمعنا بيصنفها كتابوهات ممنوع الكلام عنها ما هو أصل لو أنت بين 22 و 28 سنة سنجل يبقى أكيد مامتك نفسها تطمن عليكي أنا لو منك الرز ده ما تلوش خالص لو ما رحتيش التمرين مش هتكلم معاكي ليش شكلك أكبر من سنك؟ صرحي شعرك مش هنزل معاكي كده لا لا لما نلاقي حد ماشي على الرصيف ننزل ونلف من بعيد ما تخليش حد يقرب مني خلينا نرفع راسنا كده ونتبسط ما عندناش بنات بتطلع يا حبيبتي بصي بتوثق التجارب والقصص دي وبتعرضها على المسرح للتعريف بقضايا ومشاكل الستات والرجاله في مصر بنحاول نعكس صوره حقيقيه لواقعنا كل يوم الواقع اللي بيرفض كتير انه يواجهه قلت لك النهارده الجمعه ما عنديش حاجه تطلع معاك اعمل لك ايه يعني بدل ما تقول لي في الشارع يعني انا ما عارفه بنفسي ما تتصرف ايه واحدة بنت معدية وشوية عيال ساعة يتلموا عليها؟ لا 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 والبنات ما يعرفوا تدلع وقال ايه مش عايزيننا نبص؟ ما انا لازم هبص ماشي بتدلعني كده يمين وشمال ده اسم مش بنت عرب انا دخلت عقد المرضى اللي واحد مد ايده على جسمي عملنا حوالي 20 ورشة حكي 57 عرض حكي لقصص من مصر سافرنا اسكندرية وبورسعيد والسويس والمنيا وأسيوط وطنطا وأسوان ودمياط والأقصر سافرنا لبنان والأردن وفرنسا وإنجلترا والسويد والهند سمعنا وسجلنا أكتر من ألفين قصة Sí, sí. Eh, bueno, mm, ahora mm, puse abrir un montón de parábola, ¿no? Porque también pude hacer eh, preguntas a, a las, a las ponentes, bueno, a las artistas. Eh, yo puse, antes de aprovechar el meu papel de moderadora, <ríe> y me agradaría hacer la, a las dos una pregunta que sería... Qui, uh, quines figures els inspiren, les inspiren, perdón. Eh, si tenen algun, alguna referent o uh, un altre artista o una, o una dona en general que, que les inspiri. Gràcies. Someone who inspires me, I think... Um, there's a lot, yani, their list is very long because uh, again, thanks to social media, there is a lot of artists that you get to follow and see their work and their progress every day, even if you never met them, even if they're not living in the same country that you live in. So 
any artist I know inspires me. Just um, going to social media, seeing them doing what they're doing and uh, creating content is inspiring. Um, maybe I would mention, though, a uh, few artists that I like. Um, maybe a Sudanese artist, I will mention uh, Hassan Musa. He's a man, though, <laughs> so uh, he's a calligrapher. And uh, um, I have, I'm really fascinated by calligraphy. I think it's a very beautiful art, and it's very difficult, especially Arabic calligraphy. And uh, he's someone who, who became an icon as, as a calligrapher and, uh, as, and became an international, international artist. So maybe um, <coughs> he's, he's definitely one of the people that I really admire. Thank you. Um, I think I'm always inspired by the women I work with. And it's and mo usually the most inspiring um, are women who come from very humble social classes. When you mentioned the question, the first thing that came to my mind is a woman, and she she's around forty. She's a single mother. She um, she had to go through court for years to divorce her husband, and she was sharing story of how she deals with people who harass her on the street, and she's chubby. Okay and she was wearing black, and she wears slippers. And in Egypt, the slippers we wear are pretty heavy. And she was showing me a technique of how <laughs> she just raises her legs, <laughs> and then the slippers goes in the air and she catches it. And then she just <laughs> chases the harasser. And I was so inspired. Because, I mean, I wish, I wish the setup would help me to show that. She would just stand, and then... Just basically, you know how the, how the people in football, they kick a ball, and she would just kick her, her slippers in the air. And <laughs> so, Excellent. Yeah, another, I mean, another woman had a very similar, very inspiring technique. Um, when she got harassed in the bus, she would take a pin from her headscarf, and she would put it in the legs of the harasser next to her. So, I mean, those are the kind of women that inspired me. Not that I'm promoting violence, but yeah. Excellent. Muchas gracias, don Sara. Si algo te alguna pregunta. Eh, sí, si vos. Ah, ah, oui, perdona, necesitame el micrófono. Uh, I have a, one question for Ala and two questions for Sondas. I don't know how I should <laughs> divide them or if I should ask Sondas one and then Ala and then go back to Sondas. Should we do it like that? Yes. Or we don't know. But, uh, as go you ahead, prefer, yeah. as you Maybe prefer. we can take all the questions and then they reply, maybe? Or oh, okay. Yeah. Right, I'll give them all then. Um, um, the first then for Ala, I was wondering, you just mentioned um, your fascination for calligraphy, for this artist and calligraphy, and yet when you gave your speech, you, you said that you chose to uh, write in English. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there isn't... Um, um, a line of exploration for you. I mean, how, how do you feel about uh, calligraphy? And in, I mean, c could you be exploring another direction through your admiration for this calligraphy? And how would um, calligraphy change your, mm. um, your cartoons? Yeah. And for Saunders, um, the... Um, one question, I, I went from um, Cairo down to Aswan and I found a very different, um, I was with my husband but I was harassed all the time. My husband found it very funny and I didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, but it seemed to get sort of more and more um, uh, heavy handed, let's say, um, uh, not literally but um, uh, um, Figuratively, um, the further south I got, and I'm I'm just wondering. You 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 showed us a, a briefly your your fil film of your of your plays, and I was, and, and 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 we saw that you went all over the place, and I'd love to know um, the impact that your plays made and the interaction you had with your different audiences in different places around Egypt, um, and. Um, 
whether you feel that there's a geographical theme that you could share with us. And the second question I had for you was, um, um, I don't know if you've heard about what some Mexican women have been doing um, uh, with the theme of harassment. Um, they have been, through um, social networks, what they tend to do now um, on public transport is to film the uh, harasser as he does it and then um, show that short film on social media in a kind of collective shaming, which is having a great effect. <laughs> and it's also a kind of warning to other women with that kind of a face and um, uh, bringing that right up to the surface and using... Uh, because there's also this issue of... Uh, men photographing women's parts of bodies and putting that on social media. And they're, they're making a comeback by uh, showing the face of the man who needs to do that, you know. Um, and I'm wondering if that has ever been a theme in Egypt, if that has surfaced in your plays, that sort of thing. Okay, I'll start by answering your question. Um, maybe because of the type of art that I do is um, uh, it's cartoons. So uh, maybe the, the the ones that I showed you at least are cartoons. So um, you want to reach a massive amount of audience with with that because you're talking about a specific topic, and you want to be able to for for other people to understand what you're saying. And actually, um, the best cartoons are the ones that don't have any text at all because uh, it's just a visual that everyone can understand and there is no language barrier whatsoever. But there is another type of art where, um, which, is, which is not cartoons, which is visual, visual arts, where you get to be more, um, uh, we, we get to be more um, expressive through, through typography or through culture. And I have been, been actually, um, uh, doing that for a while too. So uh, I do have uh, artworks that has a lot of Arabic ty typography. It's not the same that are the traditional Arabic uh, typography, but um, using text and using certain uh, cer certain um, um, sentences that we use in our Sudanese language, and put them in a way that that that. Uh, and in in this in this in this type of art, I'm more like celebrating culture or maybe trying to to uh, show parts of my culture that I want other people to see. So I use, I use Arabic in, in, in that way. Uh -huh. But it's, maybe it's two different things, maybe. Maybe I have two different lines that I'm going with, yeah. 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 And does, um, you, don't, you feel that the humor needs to be expressed in the English and the appreciation of your culture <laughs> in the... <laughs> not really, not really. No? But um, Maybe because for, for, for uh, certain things, I feel, uh, and some of the cartoons are actually, sometimes I do them in Arabic. It's, it depends on how I think about it while I'm drawing. Uh, sometimes I feel like the, 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 the word has more powerful effect in Arabic than in English because it means something different, for example. In other ways, sometimes I feel like maybe I should do them in English because when I translate them, it doesn't also give the same exact effect. So that's another reason to do it. But uh, we're celebrating culture in both ways. So, and, uh, could you share with us the difference with the Sudanese sense of humor, or if there would be? Um, yeah, maybe I should have one of the pictures to to show you. Um. Maybe if we can open this one. So I don't think the illustration is is uh, is very clear on this one, but um, this it's it's been like a collection of chairs that I designed that is basically provoke yeah, poking on the idea of 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 extra hospitality that Sudanese people have, mm -hmm. that we spend we can spend like ten minutes basic, basically greeting someone, uh, and this is. Along, uh, this is what basically we're being going to be saying, like uh, that's that's the thing, and going through it all the time, which is basically giving you blessings, like uh, God bless you, God give you strength, God give you, 
and 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 basically making fun fun of that because the women holding um, a tray of coffee and the smoke coming out of the the coffee says uh, kifaya, which means enough. And and uh, actually the text goes also at the back of, of the chair as well. So for the, that's that's um, using sense of humor and culture at the same time. Of that's what you were saying, yeah. Oh, yeah. um, it's it's different geographically, of course, where we are, but um, there are similar, very. I mean, there are similarities when it comes to harassment. Of course, Cairo is very special in the sense that it's extremely crowded, so and it's very big. In in other cities, sometimes when there is a sense of community, there are considerations. So, for example, in tribal areas like in Sinai, for example, this can never happen because it's a tribe. They'll hang you. <laughs> you wouldn't even think of doing that. It's a very small community, so you could be easily held accountable. Um, in some cities that's not as big as Cairo and it's not as small as a, as a community in Sinai, it's still... Women are still, it, it feels like it's 10 years behind. It feels like Cairo moved forward when it comes to that. People are now speaking up. You see women reacting on the streets, not so much in cities. And of course, every city has something different than the other city. There are specific words, harassment words, that are more common in specific city. In, um, in South Egypt, for example, we, we had a lot of harassment stories reported by men harassing men. We had a lot of stories. And they could map out the city and say, where are the locations specifically? There is a lot of harassment, for example, that's used between religions. So Muslim men would harass Christian girls in south of Egypt because religion is an issue there very much. And, and so it, sometimes it's systemized. So there are differences geographically, definitely. Um, yeah, I don't know if this answers your question, but it is different. I'm sorry for your experience. No, no, I mean, it's nothing to, you know, it's nothing. Uh, but um, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking... The micro, the micro. I'm just so interested in... The effect that your plays have on the audience and the interaction and the discussion that falls out from them? Or? What we do is we create a storytelling workshop and what is meant by a storytelling workshop is we invite a group of 10 to 15 participants to meet on regular basis and through different theatre and drama exercises we try to build trust and create space for them to share their stories. And then afterwards we document their stories and we select specific stories uh, with them, with their um, approval, of course, and choice. And we create a public event where they go on stage and share those stories. And then uh, we invite the audience, after the performance, to go on stage and share their own stories. So, I mean, sometimes the, the, the open mic part is mind-blowing. Like... The one we did in, um, this is Asyut, this is also South Egypt, uh, where there's an issue with religion. We had the performance in a theater um, inside the church because there you can't have events in a neutral place. It's either a Muslim-run space or a Christian-run space. There's no way you can find a neutral space. And we had diverse audience, and we had a girl who was wearing uh, the black veil and covered all in black till here, and she went on stage and she shared how she's not allowed to watch TV, and she like shared very bravely her story. We had another guy, he was, a, he was Christian, I think, and he shared the story of how his family told him that his close friendship to a Muslim girl is going to get them into a trouble, and he'd better watch it. So... People were very, very brave. Um, I would, in terms of impact, this, I mean, this is easier to tell because we, we remain in touch with, um, with the people we go into workshops with. And they 
tell us how they feel after the workshop and then a couple of months after and then maybe a couple of years and how being given the chance to speak up about things made a difference in their lives and really I mean the the, the impact is very different from one community to the other and from one person to the other um, but just imagine that for the first time you have a space and you're sharing stories for the first time ever in your whole life and you could be in your 40s or in your 50s and you're speaking up and you're hearing other women and other people tell similar stories and for the first time you're finding out that you're not alone so the impact of that is really strong of course it has different the, I mean, very different stories. A woman, for example, some woman once, I think, left her abusive husband. Another, wo another one, I think, this was in Cairo, she ran away from uh, her family house because her brother used to beat her up. Um, another woman felt she was free and she decided to wear the veil completely in black. And she felt that the workshop helped her own her body and decide what she wants to do. See, so sometimes you really never know how it's going to have an impact, but yeah. Muchas gracias. Y había una otra pregunta. Eh, si puedes pasar el micrófono para acá para adelante, por si es plan. Ah, just when you asked about filming the harasser, mm -hmm. there's a there's a video going viral now in Cairo. It has been for a couple of months of a girl filming a guy who was harassing her, and it backfired really bad. Yeah. Backfired because she filmed him at the moment where we don't know what happened before that. She filmed him in a moment where she, he was telling her, come have coffee with me. And oh, she yeah. told him, no, I don't want to have coffee and you're bothering me. But apparently something did happen before because she had decided to start filming him. But the people kept saying that she just, she was just calling for it. And he didn't do anything. And this is harassment. The whole concept of consent <laughs> is just not clear mm. but yeah a lot of women have started threatening people when they um, when they harass them on the street by taking off uh, taking out their phones right. yeah thank you no 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 Hola. Sí. No, que volia agrair a l'Ala i a la Sondos que hagin vingut a mostrar-nos per una banda el seu art i també doncs, ens hagin explicat eh, elements que precisament són propis eh, de la seva cultura però que moltes coses que expliquen jo les veig una mica per tot arreu i m'ha fet molta gràcia això de l'agulla això de l'agulla del... perquè això quan jo era... Perquè quan jo era joveneta, que tenia uns 12 anys, això estava ple, a Barcelona estava ple de dones que portaven agulles d'aquelles que es diuen de cap i que es feien així, i te veies allà que l'altra marxava corrents, vull dir que és, que és una tècnica molt efectiva. Però jo volia preguntar-los eh, precisament a, a l'Ala que... Bueno, més o menys de, 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 de les lleis que, per exemple, doncs a Egipte n'hi ha i que s'han anat posant en aquests darrers anys, però ja com del Sudan és com una mena de món més tancat, segurament perquè eh, no deu ser, no sé si és més tancat o no, o és que hi ha un desconeixement. Llavors, eh, voldria preguntar-li si com estan les lleis en relació doncs, al tema de gènere, amb el tema amb les dones, a, a, doncs, al Sudan. Per altra banda, crec que vosaltres heu explicat com són importants a, les, les xarxes socials, però sembla que són com més efectives el que ha explicat la Sondos, perquè les xarxes socials a la fi és una cosa que tu estàs tancat i que no estàs donant la cara. En canvi, doncs, eh, quan tu sents l'escalfor eh, humana dels altres que també parlen, però que parlen en cara descoberta, és, eh, és molt important. El tema de les xarxes socials, hi ha repressió o no? 
en els vostres països. So about the laws, um, unfortunately, we don't have um, laws against sexual harassment. We also trying to push laws against um, uh, underage marriage, which is something that's also happening a lot. And we don't have a law against that. We don't have a law against um, FGM. And um, yes, uh, this is something that we, we're trying to push through awareness uh, so people can at least stop, stop doing that in, in their communities at first, but uh, the laws thing is, is, has been trying to, they're trying to issue that for years now and, and nothing, uh, unfortunately, has happened yet. The legal age, what is it in Sudan? The legal uh, age to marry? Uh, the legal age, it's, uh, it's uh, 18. Is there, no, no, it's not 18. 18 is, would be good because uh, 18, is, she's not a minor anymore, but there it's, is no there's no legal age, yeah. Estaba preguntando si al quién es la edad legal para el matrimonio a Sudán. If I understood your question correctly, you were you were asking if there is repression on social media. Yeah. I mean, the the government is trying to do that, but it's impossible. They're blocking a lot of websites, but people are finding ways. Uh, through proxy and, and whatnot, to, in order to be able to check those websites. But there is repression in terms of the community. It's like social repression. What you can say and what are the repercussions of that. Of course, when it comes to politics, there are repressions. You're going to be arrested. It's not a joke now. Uh, when it comes to certain gender-based issues, for example, talking about homosexuality, you will be arrested eventually. I mean, it's, it, it's really just as simple as that. Um, yeah. Otherwise, there are topics which the government might not necessarily be interested in, but you're going to have to face your community, your friends, your family, and people you don't know, and potentially hackers. Son dos. Eh, me, me gustaría saber, eh, me agradaría también saber eh, si cuando has hablado de las, las eh, cuestiones, bueno, lo que surtía en el, en el taller, etc., eh, surtan temas también de matrimonios de menores, problemas de, de, de herencia, eh, porque nosotros como fundación de las donas euromediterráneas hemos trabajado bastante en asociaciones locales que son temas muy... Um, bueno, um, que se quejan pasan, uh, sobre todo a zonas rurales, pero a molta también a, a, a zonas que están a 80 kilómetros del Caira. Vull dir que, eh, ¿Això surta? Uh, o sí, sigui, ¿surtan todos los temas tabús a los uh, talleres que feo? ¿O, o se quejan a, ver, a venir temas que la gente no se atreve a tocar? No, en workshops we talk about everything. I mean, especially when we work with a group for a couple of months. I mean, the longest would be three months, and then we're talking about everything. And she's talking about how she got circumcised, and she's talking about her sex with her husband, and, and she talks about everything. So that's not an issue. And it's easier for women in, in rural areas or women who uh, are from more humble backgrounds or who don't have an education to speak up than it is for educated women in the city. Because the more intellectual you are, the harder it is to really speak up and, and trust. Yeah. But, but then can, can they, uh, do you use these stories for uh, your, uh, for the, I mean, do they accept, because one thing is that they talk during the workshop and another thing is that they accept their stories to be uh, put in, in um, yeah, I mean, um, scenography. Yeah, surprisingly, what ends up happening is us stopping them from going on stage to share specific stories, because they get this. There's this high. high I mean, there's this high of I want to go on stage and I want to share my story. At the beginning, they say we're not going to share anything and we're not going on stage, and then a few weeks before the performance, they want to share everything on stage, and and it becomes problematic because I have to do risk assessment. I mean, I would like to 
put a very bold performance and so on, but I also need to put into consideration their own safety and security. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it ends up being like, listen, I appreciate your courage, mm -hmm. but you can't share the story on stage. We will all be somewhere else tomorrow if you do. So, yeah. And the husbands, they are okay? The, they come to the, to no, see I the mean, performance? <laughs> most of the women lie to their husbands about coming to the workshop. They tell them they're going to some sort of a workshop that helps them t learn how to, um, how, how to knit or how, or how to do something. Yeah. So they lie to their husbands. And it's very few moments when I find someone inviting their parents or their husbands and then it's always, oh my God, what's going to happen now? Because you, you really never know. Penso que es, es, uh, sou molt valentes de fer aquest tipus de, de taller, la veritat, i de, i de propostes. Tenim més preguntes? Eh... Jo li vull fer una pregunta a les sondos. Hem vist uh, dues dificultats. Una seria bueno, el tema diguem-ne, de repressió governamental i en temes tabús que no es poden treure, com es parla del tema de l'homosexualitat. Entenc que a nivell doncs, eh, bueno, social també hi ha temes que, com bé que vas a dir, eh, en, el, en el workshop poden passar i poden parlar-se obertament, però no eh, en escena. Però vull llegir una frase que tu vas escriure, eh, bueno, és, eh, la llegeixo tal qual la va escriure traduïda al català, vull dir, tot plegat serà una anada i tornada, és, diu, ell, en paraules d'ella, va dir és molt més fàcil combatre l'opressió exterior que admetre i desafiar l'opressió que una s'ha creat a si mateixa. Són les veus dins del meu cap que censuren els meus pensaments i sentiments. I aquí repleguem una mica amb el tema de, del xàbaca, que també és el tema de, de l'autocensura. Uh, quines són realment les, les dificultats per poder desenvolupar el tipus de treball que esteu fent? Són només exteriors o són només també d'una mateixa? Vull dir, qui, o, qui posa els límits del que es pot fer o del que no es pot fer? Um, I, I don't think I'm always aware as an artist of what's the line separating the censorship outside from the inner censorship. Because, like, you know how in psychology um, they would say that when we grow up, we internalize the voices that we hear in childhood. So for example, if my mother kept telling me, don't do this, don't do this, somehow I internalize her voice and part of me becomes this person who says that. And so at some point, I'm not really sure which is my own censorship or censor and, and which is the censor outside. At, At this point, I'm choosing to practice self-censorship because I cannot afford to put my work and other people connected to my work at risk. So I'm heavily uh, practicing self-censorship. And I only realize that when I perform abroad because this is when I feel, <gasps> okay, <laughs> then I can talk. And I don't feel that there is pressure and, and intensity, especially if I'm going on stage myself because when I do in Cairo, I'm always thinking, oh my God, what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. And I think about it individually and personally and how, and how my own way of wanting to practice freedom might jeopardize the project, might jeopardize, I don't know, affect the lives of other people around me. So it's tricky, but now I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to do is to find a way where I can do art outside Egypt. Continue doing work in Egypt, but also because, I mean, I want to be able to know how far I, as an artist, can go. Potser podríem sentir també a la ala, a la ala, per acabar. Podríem sentir la pregunta que t'han fet abans, si hi ha alguna... Vull dir, a banda de la, de la legislació que ja ens has comentat a Sudan que no, no protegeix uh, les dones i, i altres temes, si per, com a artista um, hi, ha, hi ha censura, hi ha... també abans, però vosaltres no teniu, no teníeu els cascos, um, estava, estava mencionant que a l'Iraq 
en els últims mesos i han hagut diversos casos d'activistes i de dones també relacionades amb el món també de l'expressió, vull dir, bloggers, youtubers, també una activista, una dones propietàries d'un saló de bellesa que han estat assassinades i volia saber una mica si vosaltres estàveu assabentades, si també vosaltres esteu, vull dir, hi ha un perill d'això o al vostre país la situació és més, bueno, és una mica millor i teniu una mica la vostra opinió també d'això, perquè crec que abans no heu sentit la referència que havia fet. To talk about self-censorship or censorship in my country, I think when it comes to my work, because I do visual art, I think if I was relating to mainstream media or traditional media like newspapers or or maybe national TV or something, that, that would have been a different story because, um, of course, uh, there is a lot of the things that I do would not be accepted in that kind of media. That's why I talked about, about social media being an outlet for most of the creatives in Sudan because um, you, can, you can, to some extent, uh, control your own content and control your own um, um, what, what, what you, nothing that you do can, can really be uh, a bigger problem like for example, going, doing something on the street or, or going, uh, doing something on a newspaper or on a TV or something like that. And here comes, um, maybe the self-censorship -censor part comes in, in another way that um, at the end when I, when I, for example, I draw something or do a cartoon, I'm not, um, it's not like, I'm not saying that this is the ultimate truth and this is how things should be. I'm trying to create a conversation. And, when you try to create a conversation with the people you're talking to, you, you, you put in regard the, the boundaries that they have for themselves. So, so you uh, take in consideration the, the, the social boundaries that they have, the religious boundaries that they have. You don't want to offend someone, someone so much that they feel attacked and they don't feel like they want to be part of the conversation you, you are trying to have. So uh, maybe the self-censorship part, part comes in, 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 in that area. And even, even people who have uh, more freedom, I think they should practice that every now and then, that um, you, you, you can do, you can draw a, a cartoon, for example, or do an illustration or a visual art or, or, or a performance that, that, that maybe in, in, insults someone and, and nobody, nobody will, you will not be affected by that in ways like, um, you're not gonna be arrested by it or, or, or face anything extreme. But um, you should ask yourself if that helps the situation or damages the situation because w even if you have freedom that comes, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it that you have to um, uh, be, be aware of the, the audience you're talking to. So maybe the self-censorship for me comes in that area. If I faced uh, problems before, or if people have faced problems before, doing even in social media, of course, you can you can face problems if you are very outspoken, if you talk about uh, certain things, and especially in certain areas where, where the the um, political um, poli politics, of course, it's a big taboo. So uh, when there is um, certain politic, uh, the politics or the political uh, situation in Sudan is not very stable, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then the people who are very outspoken, maybe they, they, there is a lot of arrest, arrest that happens and they get arrested and, and of course this is, this is something that happens quite often, so, yeah. But I think the second part was... That's for me? Yeah, I think so. Uh, m my life is not in danger, I, I think. Uh, I'm not working in anything political at the moment and I'm being careful just because I know it's not a good time to take heroic uh, risks. Um, so no, really, I just need to, m m my issue with most of the performances is the ang angry mob, you know, when you find a member of the audience unhappy or wanting to stop us. I mean, there, were, uh, there was a time when I got beaten up in a performance, but this was a, a performance in the subway. So we were taking a very big risk. And so one woman did not like that and she, she decided to kind of handle it herself. So she just pulled us 
with our hair and she ended up chasing us, but otherwise, otherwise it's been okay. I mean, we've been managing. Bueno, no sé si hay más preguntas, si no, pues se queda ahí a, a, la, a la ala y a la sondos y a la Mireia. No, pues a otra cop. Pero eh, y este, esperemos que el año que viene también haya una nueva edición. Y, y, pude, y bueno, también espero que a lo mío, la, a lo mío un día la sondos se va al Sudán a hacer los talleres. Si eso es posible, porque creo que sería muy bonito también. Muchas gracias a tu Tom y buena nit y fin de una otra. Y eso no es. Ah, el Fort Pien. Sí, sí, igual que. Vale. Sí. Sí.